Now in looking at my guide planes, I would like to create two rather parallel surfaces and I would like that guide plane to be at least two millimeters from the marginal ridge to the bottom, two or three. And when I look at this particular cast, I have a discrepancy in that this posterior tooth leans severely to the mesial, especially on that lingual cusp, even though my guide plane is going to be more centered between the buccal and the lingual cusp. So I can improve how much I have to take away. In other words, in order to create that guide plane, I have to take more away right now the way it stands. But if I loosen my knob and I bring this posteriorly a little bit, I tilt it to the distal, I am making that space of light in there, the undercut, less radical and I would have to remove less tooth in this area and I would still come up with a relatively good guide plane in that area. Um, my survey line has moved up a little bit. Now I can experiment and do it just a little bit more to where I have to remove less to get the two millimeter guide plane there and I might have a higher survey line on here but I still think I'm going to be coming out a lot better off. Now there's a limit as to how much you want to tilt also because when that partial denture is in final position uh, it's where the ridges are relatively parallel and you can affect retention to a point where it's not as good. So we're going to leave it right about here. I think we're going to be able to do something favorable, I think. But let's look at this other side while we're at it. And um, we have that same situation on that molar, and we've improved the situation where our guide plane will be more advantageous. We might have to take a little bit off of this premolar now, a little bit off of our molar in this area reduce somewhat on this molar and maybe touch this a little bit. So we've made a compromise by changing our anterior posterior tilt without hopefully um, getting these uneven again. We would like to have um, a 0.01 mesial facial undercut on our premolar and on this tooth on the buckle. So I'm going to put in an 01 undercut gauge and see what I have in those areas. And if I look at this tooth at this point, I can see that I still have a 0.01 undercut in the mesial facial area. It's probably moved a little more cervical than it was, but that's not a bad thing. And I still have a 0.01 undercut on the mesiofacial of this premolar. One thing you want to think about now, you don't want that undercut to be on cementum. It needs to be in the cervical third of the crown, but before you get to the cementum. And then when I look at this to these teeth back here at this orientation, I have a 0.01 undercut on the buckle, and I have a 0.01 undercut on the mesial buckle of this tooth. I have a 0.01 undercut. Now that 0.01 undercut is higher up on the lingual surface than on the other side, but this sort of says to me too, when I look at the survey line basically that's going to happen here, I want to use my deepest undercut, I think, in order to place the direct retainer tip in that position because if you think about it the in the uh, reciprocal component has to be all above survey line and it looks like our survey line would be all the way down to the gingiva over here which allows us to place that arm all above the survey line and to keep it way down on the middle third of the tooth. Why is that important? Well, this is our cusp that goes into the central fossa of the maxillary teeth. 
and our lingual cusp goes into the central fossa area. So this arm is not affected by occlusion, but this arm definitely is affected by occlusion. So our reciprocal arm could be more ideally placed on this area, but on this side, if we have to have the reciprocal component all above survey line, then it would be higher up and we might have to do more adjustment of our tooth in order to get that reciprocal component down to the middle third of our tooth. So I tend to use the worst undercuts for my direct retainer tip because then all I have to worry about is the first half to two thirds making sure that it's above the survey line and well out of the plane of occlusion. Over here on this tooth um, we have a 0.01 mesiolingual undercut and we have a 0.01 uh, mesial buccal undercut. Now ideally I would like to balance my retention. I, I've got buckle buckle, I could have buckle buckle. If I w am concerned about my position of arms, I would rather have buckle buckle and lingual, but if I have lingual on one side, I'd really like to have lingual on the other. I'd rather not have buckle, 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 lingual. It makes it more balanced if I can go lingual, lingual. Now, another thought here I want to bring up, if you notice this green area, that's a restoration in that tooth, so it's quite a large restoration. So this is a good tooth that would be a candidate for a, a crown. And if I make the crown, I can put the undercuts anywhere I want to an extent. But you have to, again, think about occlusion and think about the positioning of the arms. Because um, if you're going to place a crown here and you want distal, ideally we'd like to have a mesial rest, distal buckle retention. But if you have to over contour that crown when you build it and it's in occlusion with an opposing tooth, that may not be the way you'd want to go again. You have to think about, you wouldn't have to reduce any of this surface of the tooth hardly at all except to make a good margin because you're trying, if you wanted buckle retention, you're trying to actually bring that crown out so that it has an undercut, which it has none at this point in time on the buckle. So you have to think about reduction of tooth. Whereas on the lingual, depending on how far it leans to the lingual, if you're trying to make a crown with the reciprocal component all uh, above your survey line on the lingual, you might have to significantly reduce that surface. So those things have to be considered at the time you decide your design and when you decide whether or not you're going to be crowning a tooth or not. So um, we're going to, I like this, we can have lingual, lingual. Now we're going to, we don't have the undercuts on the distal because of the way that teeth, those teeth, lean to the buckle. So we don't have much in the way of undercuts back there. So we're going to have to do something called a ring clasp where we bring our retentive area to the mesial buckle or the mesial lingual. Yet we have to have a rest next to our dentulous area and that, that um, clasp would actually come around and grab the mesial facial or it could go around this way and grab the mesial lingual. So it will definitely be a ring clasp. If we grab the um, mesial buckle, we can also take our major connector and plate all of this tooth back here and bring the uh, direct retainer arm toward the forward. So we have a couple of options. The other option that we would consider is, what's the status of these two teeth? Are they long-lived? Are they going to be in that mouth a long period of time? Do they have major periodontal problems? Do they have major bone loss? So if we are planning for the loss of one of these two abutment teeth, then we would also consider altering the design of our major connector so that when the tooth is lost, we can convert that partial denture to an extension base partial. So um, we'll, we're going to design it planning to say that we're going to lose um, this third molar over here in the future and we'll get to that. 
But if we're planning on losing that in the future and it becomes a an extension base, then we might want to put an eye bar on this tooth to plan for its loss, and we might want to put a mesial rest on the tooth instead of a distal rest so that when we lose this, we have the ideal um, design for an extension base partial in the end. So let's go ahead and survey our cast. I have positioned my lead with the lead sheath protecting the lead so that a little bit of the lead is below the sheath itself but the sheath is protecting the lead when I put the pressure on it. So we're going to start and again we place the side of the lead against the tooth. We don't want, if we put, place this up here, we're making the survey line. We're not allowing the height of contour of the tooth. So when you're positioning this lead, we're going around those teeth but we're keeping the lead pretty much at the gingival area, at the gingival level, and we're placing that lead up against the tooth so that the side of the lead is in fact making our survey line. And we survey all posterior teeth and any teeth next to an edentulous area. And really I like to survey anything that metal may cross. Again, keeping the lead at the gingival margin and let, letting the side of the lead make our survey line. I'm just going to come on around. No harm done. Now the decisions I'm making as far as what I'm going to clasp, I'm going to be doing several different things on this cast just so that you get an opportunity to see how different situations are handled. But the ideal situation would be a mesial rest on these two molars with distal lingual retention or distal buccal retention would be the ideal. It would be less metal on the tooth, less difficulty in placing components of the clasp assembly. I'm going to go ahead and switch out from this to my .03 undercut gauge. And I want to find three widely separated spots where my the O3 undercut gauge can touch the cast. It happens to be on these real prominent bony areas. But, so I can place it there, and I'm going to come through and mark, mark that area with a red T. I should not have moved, I, I moved this by mistake to get that cast out of the way, but I'll line it back up to there. Then I'm going to make a mark here, and a mark over on this hump over here. All right. And this enables our lab man to replace the cast on his surveyor. So I placed a mark here. And here, and then I'm going to circle those in blue. No question where my tripod might be. I'm going to go ahead and place my .01 undercuts at this time so that I know what I can think about. I have, you put the rod next to the tooth, pull it up to where the little lip touches the tooth and still is in contact with the rod. So I have an 01 undercut right here. I've got an 01 undercut here. 
relatively high 0.01 undercut right there. 0.01 undercut side of the rod, pull it up to the lip touches, mark it a little bit. 0.01 undercut right here. Don't have one on the distal at all. Don't have one on, well, I have one on the distal lingual, but it's pretty far down next to my gingiva almost. I have one on some easier lingual. On the other side, I mean, I want it on the mesofacial, so that's where I'm going first. Pull it up. Both the bar and the undercut lip are touching the tooth. Um, I'm going to look at my midfacial because if I'm going to lose that tooth in the future back there, that molar, I would want to put an eye bar on that tooth. But I have all kinds of options on this tooth. You don't always have that. You're not always that lucky. I have a mesial buckle undercut right in here. I have a mesial lingual undercut right there. And I have a distal buckle undercut right in here, but it's more toward the middle of the tooth. You want it to be at the distal angle. You get your flexibility from your clasp by having long clasp. So I don't want an undercut at the mid at the mid lingual surface. That would make a very short arm. But we actually have a a mesial lingual undercut on this side also but again we got to think about balance to retention it has to be buckle buckle or lingual lingual but never buckle buckle lingual lingual or that partial will dislodge itself we're now ready to make some decisions on our designs we have a lot of options